let's stand for the reading of the word. How many knows what we talked about last week? Man, wasn't last week amazing? I'm just trying to make the people that weren't here last week feel really bad. <laughs> you missed the greatest church service of the year. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, but we, we talked about peace. And then I mentioned this online on our Thursday Power Jam, but we were blown away. I know Megan was up here at the end of the sermon, dude, and we locked eyes and we were like, dude, there was so much peace and just like walked in the building. It literally walked in the building. And then at some point, all right, I don't know, this presence, this is the, the same presence of peace that we fit, felt here today or felt Sunday was, it's, it's here right now, but that same peace that walked in the house and was with us is the same omnipresence that began to move on someone's brother that was here and they were miraculously healed of cancer in their body. So you talk about a house of miracles. We don't even know what God is doing. Here's what I love is that answered prayers, I was telling a gentleman here about this this morning, answered prayers, it don't, answered prayers don't care if it gets the credit. And so you may not even know that there's been an answer to a prayer. He wasn't up here, the one that was healed, he wasn't up here, we didn't lay hands on him, we didn't travail over him, but as a response, because God sees the heart, because somebody responded, God says, I'm gonna work in an area where you can't even see right now. And I wonder where God is working in an area of your life that you cannot even see right now. Believe it, receive it. Everybody say, I receive that. Psalm 139, I better start before I get worked up. Psalm 139, I'm going to read you the whole chapter. The whole chapter is good. But, but, you know, the verses in Psalm, they just, I mean, they just rattle off quick. So you got, you got to pay attention. And here it is, verse 1 of Psalm 139. If you're there, just, you know, say amen. All right, if you're not there, say, hold up. All right, nobody's there because I'm like, I'm looking at the monitor, Jared. All right. Verse 1, O oh Lord. I love this. You have examined my heart, all right, and you know everything about me. Yeah. <laughs> he knows everything. <laughs> you, that's why you can trust God with secrets. He knows everything. And when, man, Jared, don't. When, when, when we used to have some crazy man of God come to church and I wasn't living right, bro, do not lock, lock eyes with the prophet because I didn't need, I knew God knew everything and I didn't need God exposing my everything. All right? You know when I sit down or when you, or when I stand up, you know my thoughts even when I am what? far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home, you know everything I do. You not only know everything about me, you know everything I do. And then you know what I am going to say before I even say it. God knows you got a smart mouth. All right, Lord, you go before me and you follow me. Tell your neighbor and say, he follows me. Mm. He's following you. I want that to sink in. He's following you. Praise God. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me to understand. It's too great. I don't have the capacity to understand. So I, I, I'm limited in my understanding, all right? Verse 8, if I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me. And the light around me become night. 
but even in darkness tell your neighbor say but even in darkness I cannot hide from you to you the night shines as bright as day darkness and light are the same to you you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb he was watching as you were formed in your mother's womb some of y'all some of y'all so old that y'all can't even imagine being back in your mother's womb but listen God remembers it like it was yesterday when you were in your mother's womb and he was doing this and watching this and seeing how you were delicate delicately made thank you he says for making me so wonderfully complex you know those who are married you just need to tell your wife next time she gets on to you say baby I am wonderfully complex your workmanship just and then when and then after that just I mean give them the clincher just point up to heaven and say <laughs> and say God baby his workmanship is marvelous how well I know it you watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was even born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. You think your life doesn't have purpose? Every moment was stretched out before him. Wherever you're going tomorrow, he's already been there. He's already seen it. He knows your end from your beginning. And he knows your beginning from your end. And he knows everything in between because your life has been stretched out before him. He knows every moment. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of the sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. How many so glad that when you woke up this morning, you have a promise to stand on today that says when I wake up, I can proclaim without a shadow of a doubt, God, you're still with me. God, you're still working on this situation. God, you have not forsaken me. God, but you are here in the good times and in the bads. God says, I will never forsake you. God, right now, Lord, we just pray that this word, this word becomes, becomes a depth, becomes, becomes deeply rooted in the soil of our hearts. God, let this seed begin to, begin to sprout, God, into a sapling, O oh Lord, and help us to nurture it, God. Guide us, O oh God, in the strength and the life of your word. And everybody say, in Jesus' name, Amen. You can be seated. Today's sermon, I'm going to throw you for a loop. Today's sermon, it's called, What About Bob? <laughs> Don't worry. The service hasn't taken a turn for the worst. But uh, <clears throat> Dr. Leo was a successful psychotherapist and uh, he expects to mesmerize his family with his prowess of a brilliant mind and 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 to show his wife how an amazing husband he is and to show his kids what a remarkable father he, he is and meanwhile there is this patient of dr. Leo and he is a recluse and he is so afraid to leave his own apartment. He's got to talk himself into just leaving through his door into a world full of horrors. Bob becomes attached to Dr. Leo. But Leo finds Bob extremely annoying. And when Leo... Uh, takes his wife and his kids to a peaceful lakeside cottage in New Hampshire. Well, he loses his mind when Bob shows up on their vacation. Leo thinks he's been freed from Bob. But guess who tracks down the doctor to spend vacation with the family? 
a peaceful vacation. Guess who shows up at the door? Ah, life is good. Guess who shows up at the door? Bob. But uh, with diving, what is the, uh, what's the thing? What's the trick? I don't know. It's supposed to be easy. Well, can you give me a handle on it? Thanks. Careful. Oh, careful. Just go to the edge. Go careful. Go to the edge. Come on, toes off. Toes off. To the edge. Don't worry. Come right on. Here. Come on. Let's here. call this the edge right here. Okay, this is the edge. Step up to the edge. Well, then walk up to our edge. Okay. Got right. you? Now bend your knees. Bend your knees. Very good. So bend your knees. And stiff as a board. I am support. Now lean forward. All right, just a, just a second, don't rush it. Just a second. Right, this is my first dive. Okay. Lean, lean. Wait, I can't see what you're doing. Why don't you, will you get in front? Okay. All right, careful. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Wait, wait. Come on. Okay. Come on. Now hold my shirt. I'll show you what's going to I got it. Okay. All right. And bend my knees. Bend your knees. Arms out straight. Stiff as a board. Honey, come here, look. There's the doctor. I don't want to have to see this. No, please. One. No. Two. Don't do it, please. The comedy of the movie is that no matter how hard Dr. Leo tries, he cannot get rid of Bob. And the, all the things that Bob or that Leo does, all it does is it, it causes Bob to think that he's going through more therapy. You know, whether it was pushing Bob into the lake or deserting him in the woods tied up, Bob's gullible predispos predisposition is that everything is, is that Leo's, Leo's slights are all some sort of therapy to make him better. He's gullible, he doesn't get it, and, and he's, he's that special kind of friend. Bob is a special kind of friend, the kind that drives you crazy. You all got him. Bob is everywhere. So is Jesus. Like Bob... To the resistant heart, Jesus shows up at seemingly the most annoying times. Bob is opportunistic, like, like Jesus, if you keep pushing Bob away, he will start work, working on your kids. He'll start working on your wife. He'll start working on your profession. In fact, the more you resist Bob, the harder life gets. He'll start showing up at your house uninvited. Repeatedly until it's almost annoying. And uh, then I, at some point you just think, I, I'm, I'm going to have to surrender. And then, and if you don't surrender, if you're not willing to surrender to whoever this is that's disrupting your life, this Jesus will find ways to cause you 
to pivot. Whoa, to pause, to take notice, to become aware. If it wasn't the car wreck that spoke to you, maybe it was when you found out about the cheating. And if that still didn't speak to you, maybe it's, it's like when you looked up and you realized that everything most important to you is gone. Maybe that'll speak to you. Or maybe it's like the older you get, the more you realize you're going backwards. And that should speak to us quiet in here remember when uh you got pulled over and they found that stuff in your car that was bob remember the betrayal of 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 a friend of a friendship that that caused that relationship to wither that was bob remember that thorn in the flesh that wasn't satan that was bob Hey, Jonah, remember when God called you to go to a specific place and you turned around and you went in the opposite direction and then a storm arose that threatened your life? That storm wasn't from Satan. That was Jesus. Hey, David, remember when God caused you to take a census? that would release a plague on the people and 70,000 people died? That wasn't Satan, that was God. The Bible says God allowed that to happen. I'm going to dismantle your thinking in here that Satan is responsible for every horrible thing that has happened to humanity. But listen, the same God who arranged for the storm arranged for the fish and Jonah was in the thing that God had prepared God arranged the storm God arranged the fish God arranged the storm God arranged the fish the same God who arranged the plague is the same God who prepared a place for you to build an altar not only did he prepare the place but he prepared you to come into the place. Y'all gonna have to get with me this day. God prepared you for the place that he was preparing. And so we've been rebuking the storm. We are quick to lash out at the storm using the almighty and sovereign authority of Jesus Christ himself. But let me ask you a question. What if the storm above you is allowed by Jesus to calm the storm in you? Because Jesus can arrange for a storm and we see it as Satan rising up against us. And we don't even see that it's Bob showing up, annoying me. Everything was fine going on vacation, not a care in this life, just carrying on every day, pretty much sleeping whenever I wanted to, pretty much got the jobs that I need, pretty much going here and there with no accountability, everything is fine, but then Bob shows up and starts messing with everything. And when Bob shows up, it isn't for the faint of heart. It's, uh, it, it's tough. It can be difficult. You, you think, listen, we give, we give the spirit of darkness, we give Satan a lot of cre credit for, 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 for uh, working on our lives, for, for disrupting our lives. Let me, tell, let me tell you something. He ain't got nothing on Jesus. Jesus can mess up your life better than anybody. <laughs> to disrupt is to interrupt. It is... To interrupt an event, an activity, or a process by causing a disturbance or a problem. Bob, you are a disturbance to my peace. Bob, you think you're real cute, but I'm going to need you to get on out of here. In fact, the doctor got so desperate, he tried to kill Bob. 
I hadn't seen the movie since I was like 12. And trust me, I did not go back and watch it just to build this sermon around. But, and Sue Jordan, I am sorry about this. I'm, I'm trying to reach your grandkids. You know what I'm saying? I am so, but God is speaking to every one of us that Jesus is going to come in and he's going to disrupt some things. And I want you to be more aware that Jesus is causing that little thorn in your side. Because it's there that you begin to turn, you begin to pivot, you begin to take inventory, and you begin to build on something greater than yourself. Why is it that with everyone else, Jesus is cool, but with me, you are dismantling my life? It's because you got a calling on your life. Why, Jesus, do you take me to my breaking point? And you leaving everybody else just fine. I mean, they ain't living right, and they're good. But me, on the other hand, I'm sacrificing. I'm trying to follow you. And what in the You are disturbing the peace. Hmm. You know how you've been losing sleep at night? That ain't just anxiety, baby. That's Jesus telling you that I am the Father who can bring you peace over everything you ever face. You know that extremely, uh, extreme loneliness you feel? That's not loneliness you just feel. That's God causing you to see how desperate you are for him. That's Bob getting all up in your space, letting you know that you need each other. Bob needs you. And you need Bob. The fact that Jesus is agitating your spirit and the fact that he won't leave you alone is indicative of the fact that you are called. I wouldn't be up here trying to do this thing if I didn't believe you were called. I want you to look to your neighbor and say, you are called. Tell them. Now, when they told you that, did you believe them? All right. All right. I want you to tell God, say, I know, God. I am called. I am chosen and I'm chosen to be sent into the world to begin to bring forth a revival and a harvest of lost sinners so God uses the storm to bring us into the place that he has prepared for you and him David built that altar to the Lord and he sacrificed the burnt offerings and the peace offerings and the Lord answered his prayer for the land or for the place and the plague on Israel was stopped the plague that God allowed to happen I allowed it to happen just to get you into the place David where I could speak to you and did you know that this is the very place where the temple would be built God will use unusual things to bring you to the place where God will speak to you and say, this is the place. And when David left that place, he knew beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is the place where I will build the temple. In fact, it is on this very mountain where Jesus would be crucified because Jesus is always about bringing you into the place. He's all about grabbing you and pulling on your collar. And it's annoying. And you're like, God, why can't I just get and go forward like everybody else? But God, I'm starting to realize there's more value to my life. There's more, there's more than what I'm experiencing right now. God says, I created you. I put my everything in you. 
I watched you as you were formed in your mother's womb. I saw how fearfully and, and, and I made you complex and, and I put a beautiful workmanship upon you. And for you just to go through life and me not disturb you, it, it would be a travesty that I just let my prized possession just escape my purview. No, I'm showing up at the house. I'm coming in the walls. No, I'm going to speak to you when you thought I wouldn't speak to you. God said in David, where David said in Psalms that we read, he said, he said, not only do you lead me, he said, you follow me. You follow me into the darkness. The darkness and the light is the same to you. Because you see just as good from light and from darkness. Because your eyes are fixed upon me. So no matter if I'm in the light or in the darkness, I'm following you. Because I'm after you. I don't care you think you can escape when you go on vacation. Come on, I'm Bob. You ain't, I, I will find you. I'm coming after you. I'm pursuing you. And then all of a sudden you start looking around and you start, man, people are responding to Jesus. I, and, and that's the thing with Bob. It's like the wife, the kids started having a compassion. They were having affection for Bob. They begin to love Bob. And the man of the house is looking around going, what in the world? Y'all are causing me more adversity. Y'all are annoying me more by you wanting to have a relationship with Jesus. And Jesus will start working on those things that you hold dear until you finally realize. I don't know who I'm talking to today. Am I, am I landing anywhere today? Yeah. Woo! Come on, give God a clap. So God used the plague, or he used the storm to bring us into the place. And let me clarify the point I'm making. Because I'm not saying that Jesus is responsible for every degenerate thing that happens in your life. We, we are in a fallen world, and we are a fallen world human and and it is our default nature to fall into those things for we are corrupt we are we are sinful there's no doubt about that and we are susceptible to temptations but the bible says that temptations in your life now i just i just want to say that even though I'm, I'm, I'm letting you know that God is in control of every storm and he's in control of every day of your life and the things that happen that you, you want to give Satan credit for that, that for dismantling your life, it's, it's really not about him, but it's Jesus who is sovereign, who is allowing you to look up, is allowing you to feel pressed, to be pushed on. And he's allowing you to say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to need more than myself. I, I'm going to need, I'm going to need, I'm going to need Jesus. I'm, I'm going to need not just a Sunday experience, but I'm going to need a real relationship. But with that said, with that said, God will not deliver you from temptation. So when temptation faces you, you cannot say, oh, this temptation is from God. Therefore, I will partake in it. Because God does not tempt man, for he cannot be tempted but let me tell you we are man and we are susceptible to cravings to impulses to certain instincts to desires but we are corrupt and so we go after corruption we go after these temptations men hear me right now we we, we don't need to give in to temptation just because we have a habit of saying yes to whatever it doesn't mean we just say yes to the temptation that happens in our life. You're greater. And the, the disturbance is, is when Jesus comes in, you feel bad about giving in to that temptation. Some, some people are okay with giving in to temptation. And they're, giving, they're, they're okay with sin. And, and they're okay with, with certain behaviors and, and, and partaking in certain lusts. I'm talking to the men right now. You're okay. They're, they're okay. But, but men, I'm chosen. And I just don't give in to every craving. I don't just give in to every temptation. And here's the peace that you can have, is that 
the temptations in your life that you face are no different than what I face. And the temptations that I face are no different than what you face. And so there's a camaraderie here. Men, when we meet on a Tuesday morning up here at 6 a.m., there's a camaraderie here. Because you've been in the same world I've been in. And I may have fallen, I may have stumbled, and Bob has been paying me a visit <laughs> all Monday. And Bob is like, you better get to prayer on Tuesday because you ain't going to make it to Wednesday. But I need you to know temptation is something we all face. Temptation is not a storm. Don't get it confused. Storms, they come from God. When storms cause you to look to him, that come from God. Temptation, on the other hand, you can, you can say, you can say, God, lead me not into temptation. And you can say, God, deliver me from evil. So you can pray, deliver me from evil. But you cannot say, deliver me from temptation. Because temptation I must face. Because if it was not for the adversity yesterday and the, the ability to overcome yesterday, I would not be where I am today. I could not grow if I had not overcome what I overcome yesterday. I wouldn't be up here today. But we all growing. Thank you, God, for Bob. And his name is Jesus. Can we give Jesus a praise? You know... That, that scripture, if you just flash it up there one more time, it, it, the peace in it is that he will not put on more than what you can bear. So, so this chair has a capacity rating right here. It, the specs of this chair can hold a certain amount of weight. If it exceeds the capacity or the load exceeds that rate, it will crush it will fall beneath you. Let me tell you, there is no temptation that will exceed your capacity in order to bear it. So you may fall in a way where you are faced with temptation, but it does not exceed your ability to overcome it. I'm speaking to somebody right now and I'm preaching into your spirit. You have the ability to overcome every temptation in your life. You have it. You ha it's within you right now. It's within you right now. He will not allow the temptation to be more than what you can stand. When you are tempted, here's two elements that come with temptation. I don't even know why I'm on, I was, I was going to touch on this, I was going to move, but let, let me just tell you, there's two elements that come with temptation to identify or it, for it to reveal itself to you that it is temptation. Two elements. One is desire. All right, it's inherently in that scripture right there because I know you cannot tempt me with something that I do not desire. Okay? All right, if I see a plate of turnip greens and you tell me not to eat them, we're good. You bring a half pint of vanilla ice cream, homemade Tealy Paybon style, we're going to have problems. Because those are things I desire. So one element of a temptation is desire. The other factor of you being able to recognize that it is temptation is that with temptation comes a way of escape. I will show you a way out. Temptation comes with desire and a way of escape. Temptation comes with desire and a way of escape. So you're feeling good right now. Yeah, I'm going to overcome it. But when you walk right out those doors and Monday hits you square between the eyes and you ha, yee, woo, ha, hmm. And then Tuesday comes, and Tuesday's too much. Tuesday is too much. I mean, I, there's a way of escape. Just, just, just believe it. And so you got to train yourself to look for the nearest exit. 
And when you begin to withstand temptation, what does God do? He begins to change your palate or your desires. Remember when David said, God, you grant me the desires of my heart? You know, he's not saying that God's Santa Claus and I'm going to give you whatever you want. No, he is saying, God, you're going to give me the desires to want. And so when you become overcomers, God begins to change your cravings and your desires. And you didn't like, you didn't like good food back then. You were hooked on trash back then. But now you're starting to like the healthy food. You're, like, you're starting to like the nutritional stuff. And you're looking at the nutrition facts, and you're like, how many calories is this? Yeah, mm, yeah, that's good. That's good. No carbs? Yes, get it. And so you begin to change your taste. All right, that's it. Put it away. Put it away. That was free. That was free. Everybody say that was free. But listen, no matter if you've fallen, no matter if you've withstood, the Bible says be careful how you're standing. And so sometimes God will allow a bob in your life for you to, uh, look at how I'm standing, to make sure that I'm standing on sure ground because you don't know what's coming, but he does. And so Jesus might release a bob, a spirit of bob. And, and if you ain't got figured it out by now, I, Jesus, bob, synonymous, and, and, and Jesus, I'm not... You know, I prayed about this. Jesus said it was okay. You can call me Bob. It's fine. I, seriously, I, I'm, I'm serious. I was like, God, you want, you want me to show a video clip in church? I said, it, it, give me peace on it. I got peace on it. So I just, I said, Momo, just turn the other way. Don't look. But, but I feel, I, I feel that, God is speaking to you right now and he is, he is, what he's saying is it's, it's okay that you went through all the stuff you went through because you're here now. And so, and so actually what happened was it gave my past purpose. And when, and when you surrender to that annoying spirit of Jesus that, you know, and I'm one to preach on the peace of God. I mean, I just preached on it last Sunday. And I'm throwing you a curveball today because I, I, I remember that verse. Remember that verse, Luke, where it says, man, I didn't come to bring peace on earth. But I came with the sword to bring division. I mean, so you got the Prince of Peace on one side, and then you got this agitating divisive spirit you know how I, how I interpret that I interpret as God begins to separate us from everything that is not needed for the journey and sometimes he prunes us and other times he cuts off a pruning is a cut back but sometimes God will cut it off when you look at John 15, you'll see the vine, and you'll see that Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. And he, he says, I'm either going to cut you back here, or, and, or, I'm going to cut you back here, or cut you off here. There's things I'm going to cut back here to bring more fruit, but there's things I'm going to cut off here. And, and so this, this, this place, this time that you're in here, I want you to know that your past served a purpose because you're here. So you have to be more aware that Jesus is after you. you we always talking about following Jesus. I'm going to throw you another curveball. Jesus followed you. When Jesus says, follow me, I believe it. Jesus, we're going to follow you. But guess what happened first? He followed me. He followed me into the place that I had fallen into. Into the spot. Into the place that I could not get out of myself. That's why the writer of Psalms said, I see you in your darkness and I'm there. 
And whether I ride on the wings of morning up into the heavens, you're there. Or whether I make my place in a grave, you are there. Because Bob is everywhere. I can't get away from him. There's one story, and, th and this, is where, this is where this all started for me. It started on Friday. It actually started, Luke, from you, from your little smart aleck comment about a week ago about a movie called What About Bob? So it was on my mind. And, uh, <clears throat> but then on Friday, I'm in Austin, and I see a homeless guy. And uh, he's got his stuff, and he's going through his stuff, and he's got a pit bull. And uh, <clears throat> God was like, go speak to him. I said, God, he's got a pit bull. <laughs> I mean, I'm spiritual, but I ain't stupid. I got kids, and I got a wife, and I got a church to tend to. And, but um, <clears throat> I went by him the first time, and I, I, I knew I was coming back, so I, I thought I'd kind of argue with God on the way, and then I knew I'd be coming back, and, you know, if God won the argument, I'd go talk to him. And so... And so I did. I knew, I knew, already knew myself. I was like, dude, if you don't go talk to him, you ain't going to be able to sleep tonight. So <clears throat> I go over there, and he's, on, and he's on this access road, and there ain't no traffic. I mean, he's in a, like a secluded area. You know, he's all by himself. So if, if he was to shank me or the dog sick him on me, I mean, nobody would have known. And uh, so, so I, 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 go, I go over there. I go, I go over there. And, uh, and I just say hello. I say, uh, and the dog, dude, the dog comes at me. I'm not joking. It was, woo, woo, woo. I was, peace be still. <laughs> when he got up, though, he had been eating way too many cheeseburgers. Everybody in the intersection had been packed because this pit bull was like this. I said, the one piece I had was like, dude, if I run, that dog ain't never catching me. I'm guaranteed he was like 250. And, uh, and he was, the, the guy's name was Danny. Danny was like, I was like, bro, that is the biggest pit bull I've ever seen. He goes, he goes, yeah, he's just big chested. I'm like, bro, no, he's overweight. <laughs> so I said, I said, hey, man. I said, hey, hey, how are you? You know, and I said, I just want to come over here and say hello. And uh, I ain't got nothing to offer you, you know. And he said, oh, well, I appreciate that. And I said, uh. I said, you setting up shop here, I see, you know, and he's like, well, you know, I got run off over here, and, we, and so we just begin to have conversation, and, uh, and as we're talking, nothing spiritual, but as we're talking, I'm just getting to know him, we're connecting, and, uh, and, and as we're talking, it hadn't been like two minutes, a car pulls up out of nowhere, and it's two ladies, and they have two hot meals, and they... They, they say, sir, would you like a hot meal? And talking to, talking to this homeless guy named Danny. And, uh, and Danny says, yes, why, yes, I would like a hot meal. And then they offered me one. I said, no, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. Just give it, give it to him, you know. And uh, I said, who are you guys? And they were like, well, we're, we're from a church, you know, Guadalupe on Ninth Street. And, uh, and, and so we, we bought some meals and and I, I said, well, where'd you come from? Like, and they were like, I don't know. We just saw y'all and decided to come over. I said, God bless y'all, you know, and they were off. And so I, I looked at Danny and I said, <clears throat> we'd been talking still after that. And, and afterward, I said, look, before I leave you, I got to tell you one thing. I said, I said, Danny, I want you to know <clears throat> that I have a friend and I want you to have a friend like I got. And it, the friend's name is Jesus. And I want you to have a friend like I got. And, and I said, I said, he goes, he goes, man, you're the second person to have told me that today. I said, that's God speaking to you. I said, I said, I pointed at the, at the catfish plate. I said, Bob, or I said, Danny. At this point in the story, I am Bob, <laughs> all right? 
I am annoying this man. I am Bob. He is Danny. I said, Danny, you see that plate of food? You think they just came by at the time that we were talking? I didn't have anything to offer you. What I'm going to offer you is something that, you know, I don't have. I can't show you. They offered you something of something I didn't have. And we came together all in this moment. I said, do you think Jesus is speaking to you? He had told me how, he had told me his life about, I mean, he, he's been through so much. He told me how, man, I'm not even going to tell you the grotesque things that happened to him. He should not be here. There were several things that happened that he survived. And he was just getting over. And I said, I said, Danny, do you understand? Do you maybe need to ask yourself why you are surviving these things? I said, there is a calling on your life. And I said, I feel in the spirit of Bob right now, annoying you and letting you know that Jesus is after you. And when these things happen, when a guy like me shows up out of nowhere and a plate of food comes on at the same time from somebody at the church, that's the hands and the feet of Jesus trying to get a hold of you. So now I'm switching it to you. So now you're going to be Bob and you're going to start annoying people in a very peaceful way. And you are going to start reaching. I, as everybody stand up right now. I feel a spirit right now. We got to end this thing. Right now, Lord Jesus, I commission everybody in this place. God, there are people in here that do not feel worthy to work in your kingdom. But God, I pray against that spirit of condemnation. God, we rebuke every darkness that would try to lie and say you are unworthy or unqualified or insignificant or inferior to move on my behalf, says the Lord. But listen, God, we commission every soul in this place. God, release them. God, give them a spirit and a hunger to go after. God, give me a spirit and a hunger to go after the precious souls that are on the streets, that are in the homes, that are in the workplace, that are our neighbors. Give me John 20. On Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. That's Bob. He just shows up whenever he's uninvited. He goes through walls. Locked doors don't matter. Just Bob just shows up. That's Jesus. Jesus just shows up. They're scared to death, but Jesus is like, peace be still. I, I, I bring you peace. J Jesus, you just broke into my house. Peace. I bring you peace. I broke in, I'm trespassing on your territory, but I bring you peace because I got something to tell you. I'm going to annoy you right now. The disciples are like, Jesus, you've already, you've already taken us to the breaking point. I mean, we believed you, we trusted you, we thought you were going to set up a kingdom on the earth, and then, and then, and then you got... You, you got you, you went up on the cross, we thought you were going to come down, we thought you were going to save yourself, you didn't. You got buried, and then we had to run in fear, and now you're just showing up, telling us, peace be with you. Verse 21, or 20, yes, and as he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands, and at his side, they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. And then he said again, one more time, he said, what he said? He said, peace be with you. As the Father, this is where I want to hit you, as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. So this is the secret to you maintaining your breakthrough. If God brought you into a breaking point, that breaking point is a breakthrough when you trust him. But when you get into the breakthrough, now the real work begins. Because when you get through the breakthrough, now you've got to maintain why God, the purpose of God bringing you through what he brought you through. And so that is the purpose. As the Father has sent me, now I'm sending you. That is the purpose of why I brought you. That is why Jesus is annoying you. That is why Jesus is like got a thorn in your flesh. 
That is why Jesus has allowed storms to come up all around you. That is why tribulations and trials have been able to swarm you when they've let other people go and they're, they're at peace, but you're, you're feeling the adversity of, of moving in anything in God. But God says the way you're going to maintain this is to fulfill your purpose, to know that just like God has sent me, I'm sending you. And so what Jesus did, he said, I'm commissioning you to go. I'm commissioning you to go. This year, I want you to begin to think of one solitary vision for this fellowship, the send, the send. Say it with me, Megan, the send, the send. You know, when you hit send, you ain't never getting it back. I, I wish, oh, I shouldn't have said, I wish I, the words come out my mouth, I wish I could. The send, when Jesus sends you, you can't ever go back. You are a living testimony of that. Because when God begins to move on you and say, I'm sending you, you can never go back. When God begins to produce a breakthrough in your life and you got a testimony, you ain't never going back. Why? Because I'm sending you to reach people who are just like you. Throw your hands up all over this place. Lord Jesus, send me. Send me, oh God. Send me, oh God. The send of God. I thank you for the spirit of Jesus that has broken into my home and into my life. I thank you for pulling me aside, oh God, and breaking into my little comfort realm and saying, I got more for you, Jared. I got more for you, Megan. I got more for you, Luke. I got more for you, Gary. I got more for you, Randy. I got more for you. All we got to do is tell somebody, hey, I want you to have a friend like me. His name is Jesus. Just, just, just saturate yourself in the spirit of God. Make room for him today in Jesus' name. Here is where I lay it down. Oh, God. Every burden, yes, every crown. Yes, Jesus. This is my surrender. Oh, God. This is my surrender. Yes, Jesus. Oh, yeah. Here is where I lay it down. Every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender.